Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second part of week three of Sky Splash. We have Brian with us today on how to navigate alliance selection. If you have any questions for him at any point, feel free to leave them in the chat and I'll let Brian take it from here. Cool. Thanks, Sabrina. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Maher, and we're going to talk about how to navigate alliance selection. <clears throat> So a uh, little bit of background on me. Um, I currently mentor team 333, the Megalodons in Brooklyn. Before that, I was a mentor on team 2791, Shaker Robotics. And even before that, I was a student on team 1257 Parallel Universe in New Jersey. Uh, when I'm not doing robot stuff, I'm a software engineer at Bloomberg. And um, in college, I studied computer science and math at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I threw together this table to provide some quick context on where I've been throughout um, the alliance selection process. Um, these are just the alliances and how many times I've been captain, first pick, or second pick on um, that number alliance. Um, so I've been all over the place. And I really hope that this talk has something for really everyone trying to navigate this process, whether you're you might be the number one seed looking to make that winning pick or whether you're on the cusp and trying to figure out how to make it into Saturday or Sunday afternoon playoffs. So let's get to it. Uh, a few quick tips I'd like to give uh, on things you can do before the competition to put yourself in a good position to rank high and pick your own alliance. Uh, the biggest one I recommend is finish early and your driver should practice driving the robot, ideally multiple weeks before your first competition um, to really iron out both the kinks in the robot and also get to the point where the driver can do, can play most of the game on muscle memory, which is really important for playing consistently in all of your matches. Uh, the next one is a lot easier said than done, but ideally your robot shouldn't break because um, it makes it a lot harder to win matches when your robot is broken and being able to consistently win matches is an important part of ranking high. Um, so this means um, you should build a simple robot that is within your means. So that way it is easy to make it simple and robust and sturdy and able to withstand getting a beating in competition. Um, and it's really important that to be able to do that you build within your means and don't go crazy trying to do every single part of the game. Just build what you can build and you're confident you can do well at competition. Um, when it comes to doing maintenance of the competition, it's really helpful to have a pre-match checklist, which is a piece of paper that you fill out before every single match. There should be someone whose job it is to fill it out and make sure everything is done. And it lists all of the maintenance items that you need to do between each match to make sure that your robot is in tip top shape and you don't break for stupid reasons that are preventable. And lastly, I'm going to highlight that your electrical panel and all of your electrical components should be somewhere that is easy to access. So that way, if you need to troubleshoot on a tough turnaround, uh, you can spend your time actually troubleshooting instead of taking the time and having to pull apart your robot to actually get to the components. And lastly, I'm going to highlight designing for ranking points, especially when there are easy things you can do to get ranking points. The example I'm going to focus on is, for example, in 2019, when you had the level three climb, that was a pretty difficult engineering task. If, that was, if you thought that might have been a bit too much of a reach for you, one thing you can still do to try and get those ranking points is the, was the level two climb, where it's, you would need two level two climbs to get a ranking point instead of one level one climb, but it was a lot easier. You only had to go a few inches off, up off the ground. Um, and if you had another partner who could also do it, it was basically as good as a level three climb and a whole lot easier. And designing for RP doesn't necessarily mean designing for four RP every single match because that is really hard. And like I said, you need to build within your means to be able to, to build something sturdy that's going to hold up in every match and perform well in every match. Um, very few teams are capable of 
building a robot that can get 4RP consistently. So just try and take as much low hanging fruit as you possibly can to open yourself up to getting those bonus ranking points because they do add up. And this isn't really meant to be a scouting talk. It's not really about the data collection side of the scouting strategy. If you want to go on a deep dive with that, I recommend you tune into the talk I am doing with Joe Blay from Sty on next Saturday, where we're going to do a really deep dive on the whole scouting strategy process um, and ways you can improve your system there. But just to keep it short and provide a few helpful tips, um, I firmly believe that you should always scout even if you don't think you'll be picking because one, you can get lucky. The first time I was ever an alliance captain was at the 2014 first Mid-Atlantic District Championship, which we were surprised to qualify for. Um, we, at our previous competition, we went completely unpicked and the competition before that, we were the second to last pick of alliance selection. So we were hardly expecting to make playoffs, let alone be an alliance captain. So you can really always get lucky and you need to be ready for that if you want to do well in playoffs. And there's the fact that you can use the data you collect to play to plan for your pause matches and try and maximize your chances of getting those ranking points and becoming an alliance captain. So a good scouting system is reliable, relevant, and reasonable. Reliable meaning that it works every match. You should not have any issues that cause you to lose or miss data. Um, this goes doubly so for anyone who wants to use a fancy electronic scouting system or tablets or anything like that. Um, this just introduces more possible failure points. I'm not saying you shouldn't use a system like that, um, but you need to really take care to minimize your risks of things going wrong if you do take that approach. The data you collect should be relevant, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. You want data that is going to be helpful and useful in actual situations where it can be either used to help plan a match or figure out whether you want to pick a team. Um, you really want to avoid collecting data that isn't relevant because one, it distracts from collecting important data. The more SCAT has in front of them, the harder it's going to be to get everything right. And scouts aren't going to want to collect data that they don't think is going to be useful because no one wants to do anything that they know is a waste of time. And lastly, the data you collect should be reasonable as far as the amount and how scouts have to input it during a match. There's a lot going on and scouts need to be able to focus on everything they want to collect and be able to easily enter it into whatever system you're using. And the last scouting tip I have is watch earlier events and try and try out your scouting system there. Make sure it collects, um, it's easy to use to collect and collects only information that you think is going to be useful. Um, and on a less scouting related note, watching earlier events is really helpful for figuring out what kinds of alliances work well and what kind of alliances don't work as well. So what is a pick list? This is probably the most important single topic of this talk. Um, a pick list is a document that a team creates to help them prepare for alliance selection. Um, and it should be a list of teams who you want to pick and why in the order of how much you want them. Um, this list should be created using your scouting data. And if you don't have any, uh, you should ask around nicely because odds are there's a team at your competition who has some data that they're willing to share if you ask nicely enough. Um, if, that, if you don't have a time to do that or everyone says no, um, you should not just look at the rankings. They are not a good pick list um, because one, teams can, teams can get lucky or unlucky with who they play with or against, and that's a big factor in where they end up being ranked. And even if that wasn't a factor, just because a team is the best team doesn't necessarily mean they're the best team to play with you, which we're going to talk about more later. Um, your pick list should be 23 teams long. Even if you're the eighth seed, even if you don't think you'll need that many teams, because one, um, the number 23 comes from their 24 teams in alliance selection, minus yourself, gives 23 teams. And if you end up as on that number one alliance, you need to be ready to make that 24th pick. 
Um, you might not expect to get picked that early, but you never know. You really don't until it starts happening. And being not having enough teams on your pick list is a really uncomfortable position that you really want to try and avoid. Actually, I usually like to build in more than 23 teams on my list, like a couple more, in case someone crashes and burns on the second day um, and we need someone to replace them, or we're talking with our captain or first pick and they don't like one of the teams we have in mind. We want to have a backup that we can suggest that they like more. Um, so when to make a pick list. Um, when you're likely to rank in the top 15 robots, because if one picks two, three picks four, five picks six, et cetera, that means the eighth captain is going to be the 15th ranked team, which is not a super common occurrence, but I have seen it happen before at competition. So you should be ready no matter if you have any chance of being a captain. And if you're a likely first round pick, first round picks can help captains make later picks. So if you think there's any chance at all you might be a first round pick, it's a really good idea to come prepared with a list of robots that you might want in the second round so you can help make that decision. Even if you're not really expecting to be a first round pick, um, that's actually when I'd be more concerned about having a list because if you don't think you should be a first round pick and you end up being a first round pick anyway, um, the captain might not have the best scouting and might need help with making that pick. So you should really come ready to help make that pick. All right, now we're gonna talk a bit about the process I like to use to actually make that list. Um, this is how I like to structure the conversation I have um, the night before alliance selection when I'm sitting with the team after the competition and we have all of the data in front of us and we're trying to figure out who we want. First, I like to talk about what um, our roles are for the event and make sure we're all on the same page, whether it's winning or qualifying for champs via winning or a wild card. Or if I'm working with a district team, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page about how district points work, um, which the differences can be subtle in how these different goals um, shape alliance selection planning. Um, but it can make a big difference between. For example, district teams get 10 district points if they advance from quarterfinals to semifinals and lose in semifinals, um, which is a lot of points. It's worth a substantial amount to be able to do that. Whereas with a, if you're a regional team, um, there's no, not really a material difference between losing in quarters and losing in semifinals. You're not qualifying for chance on that either way. Um, so you, this usually leads to regional teams um, being a little more risky to try and make it to finals for a win. Um, so from there, I think it's really important to discuss your own strengths and weaknesses. Like you need to look, you should scout yourself and collect objective scouting data about yourself and look at that data and talk about what you do, what your robot does well and what your robot doesn't do as well in a really blunt way so that you can figure out what Alliance strategy plays to your strength and helps play down your weaknesses. Um, so once you have that understanding of what you're good at and what kind of role you want to play, you should talk about what kind of alliance you want to build where you can play that role, which involves looking at who the other who the top teams at your event are and understanding what kind of strategies they might attempt in playoffs and picking an alliance that will play well against them. You really don't want to build the wrong kind of alliance um, because if you go for the wrong strategy and you just the strategy doesn't work well enough to win, you can doom yourself before playoffs even start. Um, one thing that I found can be pretty helpful, like I said before, is watching early competitions um, before and to get a sense for what strategies work really well. Um, what doesn't, maybe something that you thought would be really good actually doesn't play out as well is something you didn't account for, or maybe something uh, someone comes up with a strategy that you weren't thinking about that works really well and suits your robot well. Once you have a strategy in mind, you need to come up with your list of needs and wants for picks. The needs are the things that you'll, you need your partners to be able to do in order to execute your strategy. They're kind of the do or die essential stuff that if you don't have them, you can't do your strategy. 
And the wants are the other stuff that are helpful, the add points that make your alliance better or better able to execute your strategy, but aren't as essential. And you want to use those to sort out your teams based on the data. And it's okay to have different lists for a captain or first pick type robot versus your second pick if your strategy involves them playing significantly different roles. So next we're going to talk about how I look at data to try and write themes. Um, the four angles that I look at them, which I abbreviate CART, compatibility, ability, reliability, and training. So compatibility, an ideal partner complements your strengths and helps you mitigate your weaknesses. Unless your robot does everything in the game amazingly, picking a carbon copy of yourself usually isn't the best approach. You want someone who plays the game or can play the game in a different way than you, that, you, that together you put up as many points as possible um, and have a good shot playing together. Um, some questions I like to ask are to determine how compatible a team is, is are our autonomous modes complementary? Do they easily run at the same time? Um, do we work best on different areas of the field when we're playing the game? Um, do we require the same feeder stations or scoring locations to play to our best ability? And um, have we played together before due to ghost mode? Because that can be really telling if we had a really good time playing against each other and did a really good or playing together and stayed out of each other's way most of the time. Um, that's a really good sign. If we're playing together and we're constantly bumping into each other or trying to be in the same place at the same time, that's not a great sign. Next, we have ability, which is which just boils down to what is their robot able to do? Which game objectives can they do? How many game pieces can they score? Um, and these questions are usually answered by taking the max data point out of your collection of data. Um, so usually the best match they have for a particular objective is, you know, a good indicator that that is the best they can do. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if, that if something didn't happen on the real field, probably doesn't, it's probably not happening. Um, even if they have video of it working on their practice field in their shop or they did in their reveal video, if you haven't seen it happen at that competition, it probably isn't doable. At least right, not right, not right. Ah, at least not right now. The counterpoint there is if a team demonstrates everything that they need to do to be able to do a task, um, even if they don't do it, they likely can do it, which um, I think is best illustrated with defense is if a team is able to drive really well and has like a good sturdy tank or swerve drive, um, they can't be pushed around easily, they are probably a good candidate to play defense even if they haven't done it before. Skills all translate over to it, the robot has the ability to. Um, so you sometimes need to be to keep in mind situations where even if a team hasn't done something, they might be able to do it. Um, if the situation calls for it. Next, we have reliability, which is how often does the robot do what it can do? Uh, I think all of us who have brought a robot to a competition before understand that things don't always, we do not always play to the best of our ability every match. It just doesn't happen. So it's important to talk about how often a team plays to the best of their ability and when they don't, why don't. Is it because the driver isn't that practiced or is it because things break? Um, these questions are usually answered by taking the average of a bunch of data points or looking at the minimum or worst data point. So, and lastly, we have trend, um, which is just how they do over time. Have they gotten better over time? That's a good sign. Have they gotten worse over time? That is not a good sign. Uh, you need to look at the trends. Recent matches are usually more telling of how they're going to end up doing in the playoffs than earlier ones. Um, robots break, 
robots are improved, teams might figure out little things that help them get better. Um, they might start falling apart. Robots change and evolve over time, and you need to be aware of that when looking at your data. The easiest way to visualize this is just taking a make a graph of how much they scored in each of their matches and looking at which way it's moving over time, if it's trending up or trending down. Um, if they got significantly worse over time, I think it's often a very good idea to ask them why. If there is like one thing that they had issues with and they fixed it or know how to fix it, that's usually a good sign. If they've been chasing various gremlins the whole time, like in this match, they had an issue with this gyroscope and in another match, they had some other electrical issue. And then one match they had an infinite loop in their code like if it's a whole bunch of different issues that happen over time, it's usually a sign to be concerned about um, the stability of the robot as a whole. And especially if they don't seem to have a good handle on each and every problem they've had. So usually, you know, the ideal is to pick a robot that is very reliable and is able to score a lot of points and does that often. That's ideal, right? but there are only so many robots at a competition that can do both those things well. So sometimes you have to make a choice between a robot with a high upside or a robot that is very consistent. And to make that choice, you need to both understand where you fall on that spectrum and you need to understand your opponents. Do you need to have a reliable partner who won't drop the ball or a wild card that might just have an amazing match? Usually seeds one, two, or three will have a captain who is pretty consistent. And thus, because, you know, it's hard to become ranked that high if you are not very consistent. Um, and thus, a consistent first or and second pick are required to minimize your chances of losing. And usually, the six, seven, or eight alliances will need to muster as much scoring potential as possible to have a shot against that really consistent one, two, or three alliances in the quarterfinals. It's okay to take some risks here if that's what it takes to win. And it's important to keep in mind that an eighth alliance can be the most consistent alliance there, but if they can never outscore alliance one, they will never make it out of quarterfinals. So really you wanna think about your opponents and yourself and understand if you're in more of a position where you need to have a partner that won't drop the ball and really your goal is to avoid losing or whether you have a tough matchup and your goal needs to be able to pull off the win and weigh your risks, the risks of different picks accordingly. So here are a few um, examples of our data from 2019. Um, on the x-axis, you have what um, number of match it is for them. So if it's their second match or their fourth match or whatever. The y-axis is how many game pieces they scored in that match. Yellow is total game pieces. So hatches plus cargo. Blue is hatches. Red is um, cargo. So uh, the first row of graphs is from our one of our regionals in 2019. Um, these were actually the three teams we were considering picking. Uh, first one was very consistent, um, except they had a slight downward trend that we found a bit concerning toward the end of the competition. Um, second team had some really, really good moments sometimes, and also some very concerning ones, especially if you look at like that seventh match where they didn't score at all. Um, and when we talked to them, they just seemed to have a whole bunch of different things going wrong at various points, and it made us a bit nervous. Um, and lastly, we have this last team who is also somewhat inconsistent, but um, uh, this was, unlike the first two teams here, it, the third team was on their, it was their first event of the season. The other two teams were on their second event of the season. Um, so they had some significant issues early on, um, because that was the first time they had ever driven the robot in a match. And um, they had some kinks to work out, but once they were 
have those kinks. Even some of the matches where things went wrong early, they still had some pretty good matches. Um, and they just had a very well-constructed robot and had a very good sense of this thing went wrong in this match, we fixed it. Um, so they had a good upward trend and a good upside. Um, and the third team was actually the team we ended up picking. That was team 195, the Cyber Knights. So is a few teams from our championship division that year, where um, the first one is actually, the first two teams are the two teams that the number one seed was considering picking. The first one is actually us, where we had a whole bunch of stupid things go wrong in our first few matches. Boy, I don't want to think too much about it, but we had a whole bunch of dumb things go wrong. We sorted them out, and once we did, we played really well with a really strong upward trend and high ceiling. Um, and the two matches where we didn't do as well were because we were up against like two of the best defenders in our division. Um, the second one is the other team they were thinking about picking, who um, was more consistent and didn't really demonstrate as much of the upside or the upward trend. Um, and ultimately, in a high stakes, um, like, got to go big or go home situation like the championship, they went with us. And the third graph is just another graph I want to throw in to demonstrate a concerning trend over time. When I saw this team's first few matches, I was like, wow, these guys seem like they're really in it to win it. Um, they seem like they have a good shot. Um, but they didn't do as well in some of their later matches and ended up being a pretty late pick and losing so um, if you can, try and avoid that bad trend. Trends down are not a great sign. Um, some other tips for running the scouting meeting that don't really have to do with the picking part is try and go to bed at a reasonable time. Um, you need to be well rested and ready to look at all the new information you get, make some good decisions when it comes time to actually make the picks. Um, Relatedly, try and keep conversations with tasks so you get a lot done without having to stay up too late for it. Um, don't get too hung up on any one team or comparison or argument because there's still plenty of data to collect the next day. You can always sleep on it and wait for more information. Um, if you're curious about something that you see in some team's data, ask them the next day. The most common time thing I do this for is if a team had a bad match, why did it happen? Did they break? Why did they break? I usually show up to the next day with like 20 questions written out for various teams. There's some variant of what happened to you in match 23 where you scored zero game pieces. The other question I ask pretty often, especially in 2019, was if we have a team that we think would play good defense but hasn't actually done that yet, we'd like to ask them if they'd be willing to do that in a playoff situation, because it could be that they just, it just hasn't made sense for them to play defense, or it could be that um, they really don't like playing defense and they would not be happy if we picked them to play defense for us. Um, we've actually been in that latter situation once and it was just an awkward, not very fun conversation. So definitely make a list, get them answered and get that information you need to make those decisions. Some common mistakes I see from the pick listing process is not choosing an overall strategy for the Alliance or picking based on brand name or otherwise ignoring your scouting data. You know, scouting data that you put in a whole lot of work to get. I personally think that teams, brands, and like their past success before that season should not be a very strong factor in whether to pick them or not. I basically save it as a tiebreaker for when I'm looking at two teams that look very similar on paper. And that might be the X factor that makes me, helps me make a decision between the two of them. Another common mistake is not having a pick list meeting agenda or organization and like a plan around making that list. Um, Another common mistake is not having a long enough pick list. Like I said, it should be 23 teams long. And when a team doesn't have 23 teams on their pick list, usually you can tell by how long they're taking to make their pick. Um, 
Another common mistake is upping a team too much because they had one really good match or lowering a team too much because of one really bad match. You really need to, especially with the bad match, it's important to ask them why it happened and really understand how it fits into the trend. And one common, very common mistake that I see even from teams who have pretty good scouting setups is looking blindly at averages. Um, you only have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 data points for each team. Just take the time to look at all of them and see the big picture. When you squish all those numbers down into an average, you lose the ability to tell what the trend looks like, how consistent they are, or what their max is. All that goes away because you're just looking at one number. You don't get the full story. And I think averages have a place for getting a good rough sort of teams, but you shouldn't make any, you should never make a decision on an average alone. So the morning of, keep collecting data and updating your list. Um, I, if possible, I recommend keep collecting and running your full scouting process on every match that happens with every team. I understand that for some teams that have limited resources, that's not always doable. In that case, just focus on the team you can be picking, but that data can be useful even for teams that you're not picking if something changes or with one of the teams you're thinking about picking or just planning for playoff matches where you're playing against teams you weren't considering. Um, whoever goes up for alliance selection should watch lots of matches and have a really good sense for what different teams are getting better at or worse at over time. I really like having my student who goes up sit on, in the stands and watch almost every match. So they really know the teams that they're going to pick inside and out. Your communication with other teams about alliance selection should be coordinated by one or two people who are running the whole thing, just to make sure that the, all the communication is clear and accurate. Um, you don't want to play telephone with other teams. It is a recipe for miscommunications and hurt feelings and just a general mess. Some common questions that a team who is ranked high can expect to receive from other teams is, what are you looking for in a pick? Um, from my experience, it's usually good to be honest about this. It's very rare that someone is trying something that's truly innovative for their playoff strategy, or at least as far as alliance composition goes. Um, so I usually find you're not losing anything by telling teams what mm -hmm. you're broadly thinking of for your picks. Um, and it can give them a chance to show off to you that they would be good for that pick. They might say, okay, um, you want to see a team that can climb. We haven't climbed yet. Um, we'll climb in match 89, so check it out. Then you can get um, a better sense for what to look out for from them. That might help you decide whether to pick them or not. Um, another very common thing is the whole please pick us spiel, which I've found, which I've gotten so many times over the years. And it really doesn't move me. I don't really think it works on anyone unless you can either offer up information that they didn't have as part of their scanning system and their whole data operation, um, or they're just a team that doesn't have much scouting to begin with, then you might be able to move them. Um, I do like to ask teams when, who do this, I do like to ask them that, hey, we collect pretty thorough scouting data, but is there anything you think we should know that we might not have picked up on just looking at the data? And occasionally we learn interesting new things. It's also a good chance to ask any other questions you might have um, because you have someone there who really wants to impress you and will be happy to answer those questions. Um, and when you're talking to those teams, it can be a little, they can be a little annoying at times. Please be respectful, be nice, they're human. They just want their high school robotics team to have a good weekend. So just be respectful and polite. And the other one, that's pretty common is if we pick you, will you say yes? If you do want to play with them, it's usually a good idea to tell them that so that they can plan around trying to make it happen. Um, if you don't, sometimes it can make sense to tell them, sometimes it might not. Um, we'll get more into the details of that later. Um, but as a rule of thumb, don't lie, that's not cool. You can say you're not sure or it depends on the circumstances, but don't say that you want to play with them when you don't or vice versa. That's not GP. 
And the other tip I have is to watch the rankings because you might end up some, there might have been a surprise upset or something that caused the rankings to look pretty different from what you're expecting. And you need to be keep an eye on that and be ready to respond to new situations that you weren't expecting. So some general tips for alliance selection itself. Um, there is no time limit. There is no time limit on how long you have to pick. Uh, there's no rule about it. You might see MCs tell you, okay, you need to pick or your time's up, who's it gonna be? Um, you might get passive aggressive Jeopardy music from the DJ, um, but that's all a bunch of baloney. There is no limit. Take as much time as you need to make a pick you are confident in, especially if you are working with another team and are having a hard time agreeing on who to pick. Don't let a team slipping later than you expected them to psych you out because you never know what other teams are looking for or what their scouts may have missed in the match. So um, don't let um, don't let a team falling further than you expected to cause you to second guess yourself. Um, 2791 actually won our first regional um, in 2017 when we were able to get a, a late pick that we were not expecting to be around that late because we knew that their climber had some issues that we would be able to fix. So they had a very low climb rate, which was really important that year, but we were the only ones who really had a good sense for the fact that it was fixable. So we got a really good gear robot later than we thought we would. Um, phones and whiteboards can be really helpful for um, making sure that the person up on the field is not completely alone in looking in making decisions, which like it, at the end of the day, it's their call. Um, but I think that having a couple people that they can talk to to get further input, maybe give a quick look at the data for them. Um, and if nothing else, just reassure them that they have the list and they know what's up can go a long way. Um, and that's completely legal. Um, I like, uh, Keep in mind that phone service can be spotty in places where events happen um, and you are not allowed to make hotspots. So I recommend having a whiteboard as a plan B if you do plan to communicate that way. Um, discuss with your first pick or captain about who to pick next. Um, it's very likely that you two were looking for different things when you're scouting. Um, so first, before you talk about who to pick, talk about what you're looking for in your second pick. And while the captain can't, the captain's word goes. And while they can pick a team without discussing it, and that's legal, um, it's not a great way to start off the partnership to just not take input from the other team. Because you can have some really good ideas working together and bouncing ideas around. Um, someone should keep track of the alliances that are forming and keep an eye on who you'll have to play in quarterfinals and maybe semis or finals. And you need to have a sense for who you need to be able to beat to do well. And lastly, the pick list doesn't have to be followed exactly in every situation. It's a guideline. Um, from my experience, the biggest reason to um, ditch your pick list in certain situations is seeing how the bra bracket is shaping up and who you'd have to face. So I'm going to give a quick example of that from an off season in 2019, the Tech Valley Robot Rumble, where we seeded first. And uh, this, is, this is what the rankings look like. And the top three teams on our pick list were 2168, then team 20, then 6328. Um, 2168 and 20 were pretty close on inability. Um, 2168 just had a slightly higher ceiling. Um, but them and 20 were pretty close. There was a bit of a gap between them and 6028, who's next. And then there was a larger gap between them and the next best team, who was 1493. Um, we could have picked 2168, who was ranked eighth. And we probably would have won with the two best robots there. But um, if one of us broke in finals, for example, and we had to face 20, who was the number two seed, and 6328, the next two best robots, that would have been a really hard matchup where they would have been a really big thorn on our side if anything was going wrong. So by picking team 20 instead, they were the number two seed, the odds that 
2168 would be on the same alliance, was very, very small, um, which meant that we would give up a little bit of firepower on our alliance in exchange for having a significantly easier path to win. And it actually did play out that way. Neither 2168 nor 6328 made it to finals. And we actually broke in our second finals match. Um, like from the very beginning, we were useless. We didn't even cross the line in auto. Um, so if we had a stronger alliance, we would have had a much harder time winning that match. Um, but we, instead, we just barely won by two points in the second finals match to win the event. So um, in addition to thinking about who, how good your alliance would be, you also need to consider who you'd be playing against. So next we're gonna talk a bit about when to decline. Note that when you decline another alliance's invitation, you, have, you are not allowed to say yes to anyone else. So you are only able to be an alliance, you're only allowed to play in playoffs at all, you are an alliance either by the already being in the top eight that will be alliance captains when you say no, or if you're willing to take on a lot of risk and gamble on whether or not you play at all, you can, if you think, if you're pretty sure that you will move up to be an alliance captain, you can say no, but there is always a chance that you're wrong and you don't get to play in a playoffs at all. So I don't recommend going that route. And it's not a fun conversation to have with the rest of your team about why you're not playing in playoffs at all. So generally, I do not recommend saying no unless you are on the carpet as one of the teams that will definitely be an alliance captain. So um, there are two kinds of situations that I think motivate saying no and it being a good idea. If you are confident that you can build a better alliance by saying no. Um, if you think, if you're sure you will get a better first round pick, then you should definitely decline. Because sometimes rankings can be a bit wacky. Teams end up ranked a little too high or a little too low. Um, so you might be able to get a team who's better than the one that's trying to pick you. And as an added bonus, you will get a second pick that is earlier in the draft. So you'll get someone who's the same or better than what you would have gotten saying yes. The other thing is, even if you don't get a better first pick, it might make sense to decline so you get an earlier second pick. Because remember how the draft um, goes backwards in the second round. So if you decline, you get an earlier second pick. And depending on um, how the distribution of how good teams are on your pick list, you, um, you need to understand the drop offs, which are spots where you might have two teams that are pretty similar in ability and there wouldn't be that much of a difference between whether you get team A or team B, but maybe the next team on your list is significantly um, lower performing and it might actually make a significant difference. So you need to understand where those drop-offs are and if saying no would put you in a better position to be on the right side of those drop-offs in the second round. Uh, sometimes it can make, have more of an impact than where you fall in the first round. Like as an example, um, if you're if you get picked by the number five captain and you'd be the number seven captain otherwise, there's usually not a ton of difference between the fifth robot picked in the first round and the seventh robot picked in the first round. But there can be a pretty significant between the second robot picked in the second round and the four robot pick in the second round, especially if it's a game where the where you might be using different criteria to pick first round picks, second round picks, like 2019, where most second picks were focused around defense. Having a really good defender can make potentially a really big difference. So if you can't get a better first pick and getting an earlier second pick isn't worth a weaker first pick, you should just accept. There's nothing inherently good about declining. It doesn't make, mean that you're clever or smart or strategic. You just gotta look at whether it puts you in a better position. And the other kind of situation where you should accept or decline is depending on which side of the bracket it would put you on, especially if you're on in a regional team. 
Um, because if you're on the one, four, five, eight side of the bracket, if you're not the number one seed, you have to beat the number one seed to make finals, uh, which can be pretty challenging. So if accepting or declining would put you on the less favorable side of the bracket, that's something to keep in mind. And like I said, it's very important for regional teams. You need to make it to finals to qualify for champs. And uh, this is a good rule of thumb, I found from my experience, as far as what captain spot you should prefer to be. So we're going to wrap up this talk by talking about declining, taking to the next level with a strategy called scorching the field, which refers to a team picking multiple other teams that they expect to decline them to form their own alliances, which can be used strategically to split up good robots into weaker alliances. This often can be employed when a team is ranked significantly higher than they should be for whatever reason. Um, and when they're confident that other highly ranked teams will say no to them. And when um, more competitive teams are ranked in the top eight, because you can't, force a team to decline who isn't in the top eight because they can't decline. So um, I know that some people in the past have considered, have called this not GP. I think it is perfectly fine to do, to employ this strategy. Um, it is completely within the rules and you have earned the privilege of doing so by ranking high. You've earned that position to pick whoever you want to pick. And it's not just that you're telling these teams, hey, you can't play together. You're giving them a choice whether they want to play with you or whether they'd rather do it on their own. And it's just, it is a decision that they have to weigh and are, they have earned the ability to make whatever choice they want. So the textbook example of this playing out is Team 1678 at Champs in 2013. Um, this is before 1678 was the powerhouse team that we all know who they are, who's been on Einstein seven years in a row. Um, this was their first time really being relevant at the championship level. Um, they, against the odds, seeded first in a really competitive division, and they picked four teams they were most worried against play, about playing against. 2056. 359, 1717, and 1310, who all declined them. And then they picked um, Team 148, who was also pretty solid that year. And because no single one alliance was able to have two of those teams and just overwhelm them, they were able to narrowly pull off the win and win the whole championship division. Um, so if you're on the receiving end of this strategy, where that captain who's getting declined a lot picks you, you need to be very careful with how um, you play it out. There are a whole lot of different what ifs and ways you can play out. So only, I don't have a good simple tip on how to prepare for this other than just sit with the rankings, sit with your data and just run through and game it all out. Like if this team picks this team and they decline and then they pick you and you accept, who do you end up, um, what do the rest of the alliances look like? If you decline, who do you end up getting? There's really no good answer other than just sit down and talk through it in the different situations and look at what would have to happen for you to end up in a good position or a bad position and make it the same from there. So um, that is it. So I just want to give a quick acknowledgement. This talk is based on a guide. Um, Ed and Picky, A Guide to Alliance Selection, uh, written by myself and Katie Wyden, who is a wonderful mentor to a team out in California, Team 253. Um, and you can find this whole guide, which goes into greater detail about some of these topics on Chief Delphi um, in three sections. So lots more details there if you're curious about this stuff. And now um, I'm happy to take questions that you guys might have. Uh, you're also welcome to shoot me an email at my email address if you have something that you want to ask that you don't feel comfortable asking about in the stream or want to chat about in more detail than a quick Q&A session here. Uh, so feel free to drop me a line. I love talking about this stuff. Okay. Um, 
we have a question in chat for from Noah. What if my team doesn't want to make a pick list? Uh, so that is a tough situation. Um, I think I think the good thing I think it's important to the case to make here is that it can be really um, hard to do well. Um, it can be really hard to do well in playoffs if you're. So there are kind of two cases here to look at. There is the case where um, you don't, where the team doesn't think they need a pick list because um, they aren't going to be in, up in the Lions captain. And there's the case where they don't do it because they just don't think it's necessary to do well. So I think in the first situation, um, I think it's important to call attention to the fact that teams can get lucky. And even if you don't think you'll be an Alliance captain, I'm sure if you go through the events that your team has been to, you can find teams who probably shouldn't have been Alliance captain on robot merit alone, but ended up being Alliance captain anyway. Um, and you know, you can make that case that it is possible to get lucky and that you guys could get lucky. The other situation is um, you need to make the argument that teams um, that you need a pick list to do well. Um, and I think the key there is to look at historical examples, especially if you can find any from your team or events where you've been to, where a team pulled off an upset that was not expected because they had a really good pick. I think the key there is to highlight that if you take the time to make a pick list and analyze your data, that you have a better shot in playoffs of winning when you aren't expecting to. Um, that the list itself is really just, it's not that just having a list is what is going to make you win. It's having a good process behind that list and a good process with which you look at teams, if that makes any sense. Um, okay, we have another question. How okay. would you, quote unquote, train people to talk to other teams prior to alliance selections, either being yeah. a picker or picky? Um, so I think, I think the, um, I think there are two approaches that are really good here. Um, I think if you have someone on the team who's experienced with it, even it's a student or a mentor. Um, just having someone um, someone shadow on those conversations and just come along um, with you and even if they don't even if they don't participate in the conversation, just watch the way that you talk to other teams, you know, very polite, very respectful, very thoughtful with what you say. Um, and if you can't do that, um, something I've done in the past is like role play it, just sit down. With that person, I pretend I'm someone with another team, and just just practice having those kind of less comfortable conversations. Um, this is a related question. How mm -hmm. would you? How should people say, or what should people say? Sorry, if asked about the team who aren't in strategy. Um, I'm not. Uh, do you repeat that? Um, what should people say if asked about the team who aren't in strategy? Okay, so if someone who isn't on the strategy or scouting team gets asked about online selection related stuff. Um, is that, am I understanding that right? Uh, yes, I believe so. Cool. So um, what I usually tell other people on the team is um, I usually tell them to direct questions to the people, direct them to those that one or two people who are coordinating everything, um, and to avoid as much as possible saying anything about what we're planning, just to make sure all the information comes from the same person. Um, so usually on just using um, Shaker 2019 as an example, because I didn't get to really have a 2020 season, COVID sucks. Um, 
Usually it was me and a kid named Connor who were making most of the decisions um, and the final decisions. So usually we'd say, hey, um, we'd tell the people on the team to say, hey, if you have um, if you have questions, talk to Brian or Connor, and then they would take them to one of us. Okay. Uh, next question is, how much should Qual's data be used when making an LIM strategy? So I think it depends on where you're at in when you're when you're sitting down during lunchtime and figuring out how you should play in quarterfinals. Like absolutely, that data is pretty much all you have, and you should really plan around it. Um, once the part of the thing is, as you get later and later into playoffs, usually it becomes less important because you, have, you get a good sense for as a whole what that alliance is able to do. So usually once you get into semifinals or finals, you can just look at what they did in earlier Elims matches to have a sense for where how well they're playing. And I think it'd be helpful to give the, that quals match data a quick glance to see if there's something they might change up. But I think usually as you get later into it, um, you can usually get by with just looking at what they did in the earlier playoffs. Um, okay. And how do you get your team to go to, go to bed at a reasonable time for away regional? So usually um, the style we usually take when running the, um, the pick list meeting is I usually serve as something of a moderator where I'm asking a lot of questions and steering the conversation. And I'm there the whole time. Um, and usually I try, I try and make sure that things go quickly. And if things aren't, if things aren't being productive, um, if things aren't being productive, I tell them, hey, we need to be productive or this meeting's over. And if it keeps not being productive, um, which I usually, which I haven't had to do, but if it comes down to it, I can tell the kids, hey, okay, this meeting's over. We're dealing with it tomorrow. Go to your room. And like, I can't stop them from doing more things after that, but like the kids have curfew. Um, the kids who are participating in the meeting while it's happening uh, get to stay a bit later than the curfew, but like that ultimately becomes my enforcement tool. And the next question is, have you ever been in an alliance you didn't really want to be on? And how did you handle this? Um, that has happened to me before. Um, and it's a tough situation. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that um, if you get really adversarial and defensive with them, it's not going to help. They're still, whether you like it or not, they're your partners and you need to work with them and be on their good side and have a good working relationship with them. So I would just, I usually have a quick pep talk with the team beforehand saying, hey, this might not be the best position, but like, it's our position now, we're gonna make the most of it. Um, and I try and do my best. I work with them the way I work with anyone else. I, we bring our opinions with data and our ideas on how we think we should play and really try and work with them to make the best out of it. Um, because like, even, Sometimes with teams who are ranked high, higher than they should be, and know they're ranked higher than they should be, um, are like, aren't happy to be there. Like, obviously teams are happy to rank well, but like sometimes teams know that they're a bit of an odd man out there. And like, you don't want to make them feel that about it. That's not their fault. They're just trying to win. Um, so just be courteous, be respectful, and do your, um, now that you're playing together, bring your best foot forward and try and win together. Okay. And this concerns the slide uh, before the scorching slide? Yeah. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it asks, why did you rank seed A as the worst seed when seed six has to play potential, potentially seeds three, one, and two? So the thing is, um, Usually, if you have a tough alliance that you have to face, generally I prefer facing them later because usually all the time when I have to play, 
pull off a tough upset involves executing on a more outside the box strategy. So I usually like having a few chances to get that strategy right before facing um, one or two. So eight has to face number one in the quarterfinals and has no, pretty much no room to get to practice and get things right before facing usually the hardest alliance at the competition. Whereas if I'm on alliance six, um, I have to face, I actually six and seven should be swapped on this, that's my bad. Um, if I'm on alliance six, I have to face alliance three, then alliance two, then alliance one. So it gives me a little bit of time to get it together before facing the really, the worst alliances there, or the worst alliances to play against. Um, and another question is, what advice would you give to a scout that is left alone to figure out strategy slash pick list? Oh yeah. Um, that was, that was me and that was me in high school a bunch of times. And also my first couple year, my first year with Shaker, that was the student I was working with most there, um, in basically that position. And, um, um, my advice is I think if you can find, if you find someone to bounce ideas off of who's somewhat interested, I think that goes a long way. Um, and just, um, generally, if you can try and avoid that situation before the competition, I think it helps a lot. If you can try and pull someone in, um, I like to, I found a really good strategy in the past is bringing up examples where scouting strategy made the difference, especially if there are any stories from your team's history that can be really helpful for getting other students involved before the competition. Um, and if you come down to it, um, sometimes if you're left to fend for yourself and just, sometimes there are just other people who ended up watching a lot of matches, just see if you can talk to one of them and see if they have any ideas. Um, because a lot of people don't know where to get started with online selection type stuff. And if they actually get to have a conversation with someone who knows about it, it can really get the gears turning. And this uh, continuation to the previous question, sure. uh, what shortcuts and things can they do to pull out a quick pick list anyway? So um, if, you have, if you have scouting data, I think depending on what you're preparing for, what position you're preparing for, if you can just sort the list by the average number of, I know I said don't look at averages, but I think as a good rough sort, um, if you sort by the average number of game pieces or whatever primary objective you're looking for, maybe in 20, 20 it's like average number of balls scored in the high goal, in 2019 it's average game pieces, 2018 it could be cubes, average cubes on the scale, Sort by that, and it will get you close. It will get you 80, 90% of the way there. It's not perfect, but it's going to be better than rankings, and probably better than OPR. Um, so look at that, and then you can do things like cross-reference. You can sort by max and see if there are any teams you should move up because of that. OK. There don't seem to be any more questions. Uh, so. I'll give it a minute. There might be some mm -hmm. final questions. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I think we're good. So, Very cool. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Brian, for coming. My pleasure. Thank you guys for organizing all this. And thanks everyone who showed up and listened to me ramble for an hour. Thank to this again. Thank you for coming. Yeah. All right. Thanks.